Hello everyone, Dave Blum here with Dr. Clue and with today with our webinar about the memory palace. I'm hoping you can hear me. Uh, we're going to have to rely on the chat box today, so if you could sign into the chat box as you come on. Let me know if the volume and the sound is working great. If not, I'll take these little headphones out. But this is who I am and this is where I'm at here in Santa Rosa, California about an hour north of San Francisco, and that is where Dr. Clue, my company, operates. And it's today where we're gonna be talking about a revolutionary technique, an ancient but revolutionary technique for memorizing speeches so that you never forget them. We're gonna get started in about a minute here. And as you come on, if you could look at that red box below the video, it's called Chatango, and if you could then please just sign in, uh, write your name, there's instructions on the sheet, and if possible, let us know where you are. I'm just checking to make sure all the technology is working. It seems to be. You never know with these things, right? So it's uh, coming up on one minute again. My name is Dave Blum. I am your host today for an exciting interactive webinar on the Memory Palace an ancient but revolutionary technique for memorizing speeches without notes. You can ditch your notes forever after you have done this webinar, I hope. If not, there's always further work we can do. It is 10 o'clock, so we are officially going to begin, and I hope we have a great time and a good turnout, and let's begin. Again, my name is Dave Blum. I am the owner of a team building company called Dr. Clue Treasure Hunts. We, do, we put on team building events in the form of treasure hunts and scavenger hunts and other types of interactive, playful activities. And we do these all over the world, turning different parks, neighborhoods, and museums into living board games. But in my alter ego, I am a public speaker. I am a writer. I am a certified life coach and a facilitator, a lot of different things. Today though, we're gonna be talking about a memory technique because whether you're doing team building or whatever it is that you're doing, as a leader, speaking is very important and unfortunately, many of us struggle with it. So I just wanna give you a little heads up. Uh, there's about a 20 second time lag between when I talk to you and what you're actually hearing me. So I'll try not to get ahead of myself, particularly with the slides. So uh, please do hold your questions until the end when I will be uh, taking questions. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. So let's begin. And again, uh, Dave Blum here. And uh, let's start with the story. It's September 10th, 2016, Santa Rosa, California. Actually, let me pop over to the slides while we're at it. So that is me, as you know. And we're going to continue. So September 10th, 2016. And Santa Rosa, California, which is where I'm from. And I'm stepping on the stage to deliver my first speech for my local Toastmasters club. Now, these days, I'm actually president of Santa Rosa Club 182. But in the time, I was a new speaker in Toastmasters, which is a public speaking club. And I have never, I had practiced my first speech. 47 times, 47 times, and be a brute root memorization. I figured this is the only way I know how to do a speech, so I'm as ready as I'll ever be. And everything starts out well. I nail the intro, yes. I rip through my first point, no notes, yes. I tear into my second point, and I'm rounding the final turn, heading for the home stretch, and my, uh, my third point, when it happens, someone's phone goes off. Someone in the third row, their phone goes off and I glare at them. I scowl at them. And suddenly I realize I've forgotten the rest of my speech. I've forgotten my third point. I've forgotten my conclusion. I have forgotten everything. It's like my mind is an etch-a-sketch. And someone is shaking it up, leaving me with a blank slate. I've got nothing. I try desperately to picture my speech outline in my head, but it's just words on a page. There's nothing to grab onto. In despair, I skip my third point, I cobble together some kind of meek conclusion, 
and I slink off the stage. And as I walk back to my seat, I hear that old, ugly, mean voice in my head. And it's saying, stupid, stupid Dave, you have a terrible memory. You know that. Who do you think you are imagining you can be a public speaker? You might as well just get off the stage right now, quit the club, and save yourself the embarrassment. Wow. That is one ugly, nasty voice. Go ahead. Write yes in your chat box if you've ever had a similar experience, that you've been giving a speech and you forgot where you were. Or if you've just ever had an ugly, nasty voice in the back of your head sending you negative messages. I have to tell you, I almost quit Toastmasters that night. For you see, I have struggled my whole life with memory, which is not an ideal thing when you're a public speaker and when you're a facilitator. But I have. I've struggled through with this my whole life. My brother and my dad had excellent, strong memories. You know, myself, I feel like a, it's almost like a, a, a colander or a sieve, but they have excellent memories. So that was very confusing. I uh, worked, uh, gosh, I worked on this so hard, but I, have, I will say that I have avoided certain professions, certain jobs, certain opportunities throughout my life just because my memory felt so faulty. I couldn't remember anything. Like if you give me a song, any song, I guarantee you I cannot remember the lyrics. I can maybe remember the chorus. I can sing it, but my mind isn't oriented towards remembering it. Same thing with quotations. Just it, that's the way that my mind works, unfortunately or fortunately. And uh, you know, I've looked at professions like academia, journalism, law, and said, no way. Too much memorization, I'll never get through it. And so I avoid it. So I've been working around this particular quirk of my brain for a really long time. And there it was. I'm on the stage in front of people, and it happens again. Yow. Nevertheless, I didn't quit. I'm stubborn. So two weeks later, I got up on the stage again to deliver my second Toastmaster speech. This time I practiced 57 times, and believe it or not, I spaced out again. Exactly. I lost my way once again, and a month later, because I'm stubborn, and after 67 repetitions, I tried my third speech at Toastmasters on the big stage, and bam, it happened again. Just crazy. Wow another space out. Now I really was ready to quit, but like I said, I'm stubborn. Figuring I couldn't be alone with this problem, I decided to consult a dear friend, the Google, to see if there was a solution to my problem. And what I discovered astonished me. I'd been using a completely outdated memory process. You see, rote memorization is not only inefficient, it works against our brain's natural processes. Let me just say that again. Rote memorization is not only inefficient, it works against our brain's natural processes. You see, our brains were shaped in the caveman era. And in the, in the caveman era, and I hope this might be a little bit fuzzy, but hopefully you can see. Here's a caveman with a computer, and he's struggling because our brains were not set up to memorize data, passwords, even names of people at cocktail parties. Oh no. Our brains were set up for places and images. Oh my goodness, somebody has asked if you're not hearing anything. Let's try. I'm gonna have a little test here. If you can hear my voice, please type it in the chat box. Please type yes if you can hear my voice. If you cannot hear my voice, of course, you won't type anything. We're just doing a little bit of an experiment. I wanna make sure that the technology is working here. Yes, you can hear me, terrific, terrific. We had some people that said they couldn't hear me, terrific. Were you having, before I want to continue, were you having trouble before or have you been able to hear me from the beginning? If you could say yes 
you could hear me from the beginning, quite yes. If no, you're just hearing me for the first time, please press no. While I'm waiting for this, I just want to say hi to John, say hi to Pammy Lake from Northfield, Minnesota. Sounds like uh, people have been able to hear me. Most people have been able to hear me from the beginning. Great. I won't start over again. So then, let's wrap up. Actually, let's re redo this for a second and just uh, uh, catch up on where we were. As I was saying, our brains were formed during the caveman era, 10,000 years ago. 250,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, that's when our brains were formed. And all we had to worry about at that time was the difference, you know, where is the best place to hunt? Where is the best place to forage? Is this plant edible or is this plant poisonous? Where are the predators? How do we find our way back to the cave? In this era, it was really all about places and names, places and locations. And that's how our brain is wired. It's how it's always been wired and it hasn't changed. Unfortunately, our technology era hasn't caught up with the way our brains were shaped and wired. And that's why rote memorization is not very efficient. And the Greeks and the Romans understood this. And they developed a memory system because it was the age of oratory and they had caveman brains themselves. They knew it. And they had to struggle with this. And they were giving long speeches, friends, Romans, and countrymen. Lend me a memorization technique. So they came up with a method for turning abstract ideas, the points in a speech, into vivid places and images that you could remember with your caveman brain. And they called it the memory palace. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Raise your hand. You can't raise your hand. Please write yes in your chat box if you've ever heard of the memory palace. Please type no if you've never heard of the memory palace until today. Again, there's a 20 second delay, so I'm going to wait for you. Miri says no. Anon 7524 says no. John's got his system working. Fantastic. It was worth it to stop for a moment and fix it. Pammy Lake says, yes, she has heard of the memory palace. Fantastic. Let's continue then. By the end of this session, you will be able to create unforgettable mental images for each element of your speech. Create unforgettable mental images for each element of your speech. I do apologize for the 20 second delay here. You'll be able to strategically place your images into a memory palace. And you'll be able to deliver your next speech without any notes, dramatically increasing your credibility. Imagine that, giving a speech confidently with no notes. How incredible does that make you look? And this is actually a pretty interesting point because isn't it true that when you see someone give a note or give a speech without notes, don't they feel more impressive? Don't they feel more credible? Don't you feel like that person is more professional and probably smarter than somebody who uses their notes? It's a strange phenomenon. We associate memory with intelligence. And they're not, of course, the same. We probably all know people who are extremely intelligent but don't have a good memory. That's probably most of us. And of course, we know some people who have an excellent memory, but they're not particularly Im impressive and they're not particularly intelligent. They just have an excellent memory, a little twist of their genetics. They have a good memory. That doesn't make you more intelligent. It certainly may help you in life. But this is an uh, important point as we're going through this process is to realize if you can do your speeches without notes, you'll look smarter and people will respect you more. So what is a memory palace? That's the, the gist of this. In a memory palace, what you do is you choose a location, some location that you know 
backwards and forwards, backwards, forwards, and sideways. It could be your current home. It could be someplace that you grew up in, your childhood home. It could be an apartment you lived in at what time, your college dorm, or even the route from your home to work. But it's a place that you know backwards and forwards extremely well. And let's say it's your current home. Once you have this in mind, and once you've chosen your place, you are going to turn the main points of your speech into extremely vivid images, almost 3D images. You take these 3D images, you put them into this memory palace, and then when you're delivering your speech with one part of your attention, you are actually walking through your mental house, your mental palace, literally encountering, experiencing, seeing your main speech points visually. It's like your speech comes to life. Imagine, for example, that you were in a museum and you were looking at different sculptures as you walk through the museum. Those sculptures are your main speech points and you can't forget them. You experience them and your caveman brain loves this, much more so than words on a page. I want to tell you all about how this works, but before I delve into it, I do want to take a moment to talk about what makes a memorable image. What makes a memorable image? Because that's the key to this. If you have a lukewarm, unclear, fuzzy image, you won't be able to memorize it during your speech. But if it's vivid, you will remember it, and hence you will remember your speech points. So we're going to use an example of the word anticipation. And I don't want to get into the memory palace too much, but I want to show you how you can take an abstract term like anticipation and turn it into a vivid image, which is placed in your house. Now, what comes to mind when you're thinking of the word anticipation? Probably, maybe waiting around. I know there was a commercial years ago for ketchup and how long it took, and it had that song by Joni Mitchell about, and I think it was Joni Mitchell, anticipation. I think it was Joni Mitchell. But when you're giving a speech, that's too abstract. You need to break it down. Now, usually what I would do is I would break, when I have a, a long abstract word like this, I break it down into syllables. In this case, you've got anticipation, five syllables, too many. I'm going to just take two. I'm going to take ant and I'm going to take sip. Ant and sip. I can create a vivid image out of ant and sip, and it'll help me to remember the word anticipation. And I'm going to tie it to the door of my house as follows. Front door of a house is green. and standing. Inside the door, near the window, is a beautiful, tall ant. Not like your aunt, like your Aunt Martha, but an ant like a giant insect ant. And it's a female ant wearing a pink negligee, a pink negligee. And this ant has a beautiful figure because she has, she's an ant, so there's many curves. And she has many arms and many legs. And she is waiting in anticipation for her husband to come home for an evening of amour and love and affection. And so as she's waiting, she is sipping champagne. Of course, she has many hands, so she, in each of her hands, she is sipping a glass of champagne. She's got a, hand, a glass to the right and a glass to the left and one up above and one down below. She's got six or eight glasses of champagne going at the same time and she is drinking this champagne. But then suddenly, she spills. She spills it on herself, she spills it on the ground, she slips and she falls. And all of a sudden, there's a tangle and a twine and a pretzel of arms and legs and champagne glasses. Wow. That's a pretty elaborate image. But I challenge you to forget this image tomorrow or the next day or the next day. It's pretty vivid. So what makes an image memorable? Yeah, I can see Anand is saying, it seems like a lot of work to remember a word. I'm just giving you an example. You don't have to have every image be that complicated, but I wanted to draw attention to the fact that there are some absolute tools and best practices for making an image memorable. And they are. It appeals to the senses. It has kinesthetic action. It's funny. It's bizarre. And it maybe is a little bit sexy. And what I mean by that is if you add a beautiful supermodel, if you add Channing Tatum or Zac Ephraim or, or whoever you like, 
it will make it more memorable. But it appeals to the senses. If you're very visual, you want to have lots of color. If you're more kinesthetic, you want to have lots of action. If your smell is what appeals to you or touch, you can add these to your images. The, it, the key thing is that it has an action that gives it that final twist of energy so that you remember it. To have to say, okay, there's an ant standing by the door is not enough. You need to have a little bit more to make it really memorable. And if you're really, and once you get good at this, you can create these images very quickly. They're not too complicated and they stick in your mind forever. And I've been doing this for a long time and, and I can actually create images really, really quickly. I could, you know, we could do the, like an improv and you could throw uh, words at me and I could probably come up with an image very quickly, which is fun. It's just like a muscle. You just exercise it. So that's what we did. And anticipation became an ant sipping champagne. If that's all you had was the ant sipping champagne and she falls down and spills her champagne, that would have been good too. Let's see what you can do with this. It's your turn. The words that you're going to be thinking about is the word cooperation. And you're going to be doing cooperation on a couch. Cooperation on a couch. So how are you going to turn cooperation into a visual image and then tie it to a couch? And it could be whatever color you like. That's what you're going to do. So in your chat box, I'd like you to take a moment and try and create an image and share it with us. Could be a lot of different things. You could take the word coop in cooperation and have some fun with that, chickens and coops. You could take the word operation. That could be an actual operation. It could be an operation like the game operation that we used to see commercials for back in the 70s and 80s. If you're going to do operation in your mental image, you probably want to have some blood because blood is very visual. Violence, unfortunately, is very visual and very memorable. It's a reason that Quentin Tarantino makes a lot of money. The great thing about your images is, except for today, you don't have to share it with anybody. These images that you make are just for your memory, and you can make them as fun or amusing or weird or strange, bizarre, violent as you want. It makes it as long as it's memorable. Karen wrote, having a co-op store surrounding me on the couch. I like that. Co-op store. Cool. And of course, you wouldn't want to be able to really recognize it as a co-op, so maybe you, you want to have food stuff, or maybe you want to have people. And I would recommend to give it that extra twist. What happens that makes it memorable? All those people start dancing. All of those co-op people start singing. Maybe they have a giant food fight. It has to just be a flash image that becomes very vivid and memorable. I hope you're going to continue. And if, as we uh, keep talking, if you want to write in your chat box an image of this, I, I would welcome it, it'd be, it'd be a lot of fun. I do wanna keep moving. So are you getting a better idea of how to construct a memorable image? Lots of color and lots of movement, that's the key. Great, let's start putting them in your memory palace. And to do this, I'm gonna give an example of a speech on retirement, on retirement. So let's say, that you're giving a speech on how seniors can thrive during their retirement. And you've got three main points. Oh wait, we have, we have uh, just an interruption. We have here an opera singer jumping on the couch. Jump, opera singer jumping on the couch. I'm not sure in my mind how that relates to cooperation, but thank you, Pammy Lake, for that. So we're giving a speech on retirement, and there are three ways that you can thrive during your retirement. There's lots of ways, of course, but for the purpose of this speech, three points. The first one is get a pet. Makes sense. You get a pet, it's going to help you to thrive. It's going to keep you active. Number two, work your brain. Work your brain. Makes sense. We, want, we all want to avoid the ravages of mental deterioration. Number three, find a meaningful hobby. Find a meaningful hobby. That makes sense. You want to have passion, purpose, and meaning in your retirement. And hobby is a great way to do this. So those are the three points that you're going to talk about during your speech. Those are the main points. And then, of course, there will be sub points that support 
and develop each of these main points with quotes, statistics, all the things that we would do in a speech or presentation. But those are the three main points. Now, in a memory palace, what you want to do is take your main points and give each of them a room to live in. For example, let's try this. Let's put your pet in office. Let's put your pet in your office. Let's put your brain in the living room. And let's put hobby, like a hobby horse, in your kitchen. So you've got this mental house in your mind. And in the office is your pet. In your living room is your brain. And in the kitchen is a hobby horse. And it doesn't have to be in the room. It could be in the middle of the room doing something. Or it could just be in the doorway of that room. So that as you come to the room, you see that key point and you push past it and then you're inside the room. That's not how I kind of like to do it. So what would that look like? What would be a vivid image of a pet in the doorway of your office? Feel free as I'm talking to write something into the chat box. Okay, you've got a pet in an office. Maybe it's in the middle of your office and it's, you know, I can't even think it. It's playing. I always, for me, uh, what comes to mind, of course, is that it's using it as a fire hydrant and it's relieving itself. It could be the pet in your doorway and it's again uh, making a little puddle. I don't know. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you associate that pet in a vivid way, maybe dancing. You've got a dancing pet in your office. In your living room, you've got a brain because the point was brain work. So the brain is doing something. And again, I don't know what it's doing, but something amazing and interesting and vivid, your brain in the living room and then the hobby horse is doing something in your kitchen. So that when you come across these rooms in your mind, you see that object and you say, okay, main point. Number one, I see my office, I see the pet, I know my first point. And this is great. It means that when, as you move through the speech, and there might be five rooms in your speech. You've got a room for your intro, you've got a room for your point number one, another room for your point number two, another room for point number three, and then a final room for your conclusion. Five rooms, five points, you can't go wrong. And as you walk through the house in your mind, you see your main points. It's pretty simple. You can use bathrooms. You can double up if you've got, if you've got main points that are pretty short. You can put point one and point two in your office, whatever you like. But it's nice to dedicate one to each one to a separate space, even if it's your hallway. But that's how I would do it. So according to the Memory Palace, during your speech, you'll take one part of your attention, visual, visualize yourself walking through the house. When you see the pet in the doorway of your office, you'll instantly know this is your first point. You'll push past the pet, and then you start giving supporting arguments and subpoints about why you should have a pet. When you see the living room, you'll know you've reached your second point, which is a mental workout and so on. And if you have more points, you can just add more rooms and more memorable images and you should be able to do your whole speech with only five rooms. For a longer speech, sometimes I will have every room in my house. Sometimes I will then, <laughs> it will actually spill out onto the front yard or the backyard, or maybe I'll even go to another house. It doesn't matter, it's up to you. You get pretty efficient with this after you've been doing it for a while. Okay. Now you've placed your main points, it's time to fill in the subpoints, the supporting details. And so for every subpoint, you need to step into the room and choose a landmark. You'll then attach an image to each landmark representing a supporting detail from your speech. And you won't leave that room until you've encountered each speech point, each image. Sounds kind of abstract. Let's make this more concrete. Returning to the office, what was the main point again? As you can see on the screen, it is a pet. Having pets is a great way to thrive during your retirement. And what does it represent? Have, it, it represents having a pet. Now, I have three supporting arguments for why seniors should have a pet. And I'm going to give those to you. Now, as I give them to you, I'm not going to write them down. And you're going to see this would be kind of hard to memorize when you're up on the big stage and everybody's looking at you. So number one, pets provide companionship. Number two, pets provide a break from routine. Number three, pets provide exercise. Once again, pets provide companionship, they provide a break from your routine, and if you're a senior, they provide a little bit of exercise. You have a lot of pets, you have to take them out and, and walk them. 
So those are my supporting arguments, and I want to support those in my office, my office, which is my pet main point room. So I need to choose landmarks in my office. And here's what I got. About 20 seconds or so, you should see this slide change, and you should see my office. And there are three points in my office. Number one is a ladder. Number two is what I call a kitty condo. It's a kitty climbing structure. It's all carpeted. My cat loves it. And then the third thing is a gift from my partner, and it is an inflatable palm tree. An inflatable palm tree. So we've got the little step ladder, the kitty condo, and the inflatable palm tree. And I want to attach my points to these three landmarks so that as I walk them in my mind and I see the ladder, I can remember point number one. And as I see the second one and the third one, I can remember my next sub points. So how are we going to do this? Pretty much as we did before. You've got the ladder and the main point, if you remember correctly, was companionship. Pets provide companionship. So I have to attach companionship to the ladder. Again, if you have a good memory, and you can do this with a very simple image, you could just have your best companion in the world sitting on that ladder. And that might help you to remember it. Or maybe two companions shaking hands and playing a game of chess. And that would be pretty good. If your memory is slippy, slippery, like mine is, you have to go much more complicated. You actually have to create a, you have to break it down into syllables. And as uh, someone said earlier, eh, it sounds a little bit like a lot to remember a word, but again, if your memory is slippery, you'll be glad you have those images. So in this case, I created a three-part image for companionship. At the top of the ladder, I thought of a giant comma, like a punctuation mark, a giant comma. On the second rung of the ladder, I was thinking of a wooden, excuse me, a fry pan, a, actually one of those big woks with boiling, bubbling oil. And on the third rung, I'm thinking of a ship, a pirate ship, a wooden pirate ship full of little miniature pirates. So you take the comma, you take a pan, and you take a ship, and it becomes companionship. You cannot forget it. And if your memory is slippery, you're going to be glad that you really have a vivid image that just gives you companionship. So that's why we're doing this a little bit in excess. So you've got, and then you've got to create a story, right? Because without the action, you won't be able to remember it. So you've got a companion, uh, a comma, a giant comma, and it's on the front, the top rung. And the comma jumps down into the fry pan, and it's full of boiling oil, as I said. It is so hot that the comma, which has little arms and legs, knocks over the fry pan. The boiling oil drips down and ignites the pirate ship. And the pirate ship bursts into flame, and all the little pirates have to jump off with little parachutes going, Arr, oh no, yes companionship what a crazy thing a comma a pan a ship i've got it it's tied to the ladder on to the next one for this one we have the kitty condo and the sub point tied to that is exercise exercise if you are senior and you have a pet it will help you get exercise so i imagine in my little mind a cat my cat her name is ava she is a Maine Coon, 20 pound, huge cat. I should have a picture of her. Maybe I'll put one up. And she is on the kitty condo doing jumping jacks. And she is wearing red spandex. Red spandex, jumping jacks. That's a pretty vivid image, but it's not enough. To really make it memorable, you have to add that crazy, fine little bit of action, maybe even violent action. In this case, she is so heavy that as she's doing the jumping jacks, the whole thing collapses, falls to the ground, and she lands with a thud, but she sticks the landing, and she looks up and she goes, meow, and she has succeeded. So that's my image. Jumping Jack on the cat, the thing collapses, she sticks the landing and she says, meow. Pretty crazy. Let's go on to the third point. If you remember, the third point was stress release. That by having a pet, it's a great stress release. So I've tied, I'm gonna tie this to the palm tree, and all I can think of is a giant, giant, actually like Jack and the Beanstalk sort of giant. And he is squeezing that palm tree. And he's squeezing it for stress release, kind of like a stress ball. But it is so, he squeezes it so hard that coconuts from the palm tree go flying around the room 
smacking into my lamp, smacking into all sorts of other things, chairs, and finally hitting the giant in the nose so that blood comes gushing down his giant nose, creating a giant river of blood. Really pretty lurid image, but hopefully unforgettable. And that's how it works. Now we could add other points. I have several other points and I have several other landmarks. And I like to go clockwise in rooms. You could go whatever you like. But I hope you see how this works. As I step in the office, which is the pet office, I start creating sub points and I look at the ladder and I see companionship. I look at the kitty condo and I see exercise. I look at the palm tree and I see stress release. And it's very easy. And I could do this speech backwards by just retracing my steps. I could do it backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards, and I would never lose my way. Of course, sometimes it happens that in your, if you haven't laid this down, you're thinking, okay, I'm in my room and I'm looking at the ladder. What is that associated with? And you have to really think about it for a moment. And of course, if you couldn't think of it at all, you would just say, I got, I got, I got, I got nothing for the ladder. Let's go on. What's the next thing? Okay, I remember the kitty con, I remember the jumping jacks. So even if you got lost, and you forgot one of your points, you would still be able to continue because these vivid images are going to greet you and help you get unstuck. Whew. Sounds like a lot. Again, once you get better at this, you can create these images very quickly. For me, when I'm doing a memory palace for a speech, it takes me about an hour. I think about a bunch of images and then I uh, connect them and it takes me about an hour. And then I practice my speech about three times and I've got it. I don't need it anymore. It saves me the 57 practice sessions and the rote memorization because I've or it's all laid out. I know that I just step into my house and walk around and I'm going to hit all my points. No problem. I'm just going to go walk around my house and I will have no problem if I've done my job right. It's upfront work, but then it saves you practice and it can be fun. Let's have you guys do another one. Now, if you remember, the third point, we're going to skip the second point and go to the third point. And the third point was kitchen and get a hobby. Get a hobby. That's it. And there's a hobby horse there. Now, how, how can this work? How do you relate hobby or actually let's say what, how is a hobby help a senior? And there's a number of different points. The first sub point around why seniors should have a hobby would be that it, or how to actually to, to get a hobby is to look to the past, to look to your childhood. That's often, you know, if you want to try and figure out what a hobby is going to be when you retire, what did you love to do when you were a child? What did you love to do? So look to the past or childhood. And we're going to tie this to a landmark in your kitchen, which is going to be your refrigerator. You've got your refrigerator. So how do you tie that? That's up to you. That's up to you. Let's have you do this. Look to the past. Refrigerator. See if you can come up with a vivid image of the past or childhood and your refrigerator, and let's have you write that in your chat box. For me, I'm thinking could be the front of the refrigerator. And maybe I have lots and lots of pictures of you know my childhood on front of the refrigerator. But of course I have to give it an action, so maybe they all fall off or they all burst into flame or they all start dancing, whatever it is. Maybe I've got a baby inside of the refrigerator. A little bit lurid, but it's going to help me remember. Maybe it's the past. What could I do with the past? Maybe a, a oh, maybe like a, a quarterback throwing a pass, and he throws it in the refrigerator, and it knocks all the shelves off. That would be a, a possible way. <clears throat> Again. Lots of action. So as I'm talking, if you can think of it, please go ahead and put an image inside of the refrigerator that has something to do with the past or, you know, or uh, childhood. <clears throat> as you, I'm just going to continue on as you're doing this. But there's going to be three, at least three sub points in the kitchen. Maybe the next sub point is going to be in the toaster, and that's going to be look to the future. What's on your bucket list when you're a senior? What have you always wanted to do? That could be a great hobby. And maybe the third point is going to be, um, 
I don't know, could be the, the, the stove. And it's gonna be, look to the present. What is it that you're doing right now that you could do more of? And so on. So you just keep on choosing objects in each room and attach it, uh, attaching them with your subpoints by creating vivid images. We have one here from Anon saying, pretending that I'm doing a TV commercial with the refrigerator. That's pretty fun. I like that. Yeah, again, if you can add something even more vivid, something violent or sexy in particular, and I don't wanna advocate violence and sex in our daily lives, but for images, it works really well. Terrific. I like that though, pretending to TV, uh, doing a TV commercial. That's really fun. So this is pretty much how it works. Now, sometimes one of the things that happens is you're thinking, okay, I need to add transitions to my speech. And of course, this is great. In fact, let me break this down for a second. Uh, here, we have glass milk bottles. I like that. Here, now, one of the things that happens is what the way that I do this is I write my speech out before I give it. I write the whole speech out before I put it in the memory palace and commit it to memory before I actually start practicing. I write it all out because as a writer, I get my beautiful phrases, my turns of phrases, my, my best language, my best zingers, all of that comes from writing. And if I just wrote an outline, I probably wouldn't have those wonderful little gems. But sometimes you want to make sure that you keep those gems and they make them into your speech. And so sometimes you'll actually want to put your gems into your memory palace. You don't want to miss them. It'd be a shame if you missed them. And so that's what you can do. And the same thing with transitions. You want to get from point one to point two or just from sub point one to sub point two and you have a beautiful, elegant transition. Well, why not put it in the memory palace so you remember it? Sure, you could wing it. And that's fine. You've got your sub points and your main points in there. But why not put specific stuff in there that will help you to remember the beautiful turns of phrases? So, for example, if you've got a transition between point one and point two, main point one and two, in this case, between the office and the living room, you can put a transition in the hallway. That makes sense. Like earlier, I said, figuring I'm not alone, I consulted Google. That was my transition. And I thought, figuring, that's pretty good. That's, I want to remember that. It's kind of a, I believe it's a gerund, you know, I-N-G, figuring. Figuring I wasn't alone, I consulted Google. So I wanted that figuring as a transition in my mental palace. So I put it in the hallway, and I just created an image. Now, it could be a giant fig or a giant fig tree wearing boxer trunks, and he is boxing in the hallway and punching holes in the hallway, in the wall. That would be pretty vivid. Or it could be the figure of someone doing a figure eight ice skating, or it could be a beautiful figure of a supermodel or a beautiful figure of Channing Tatum. It's up to you. So you can add transitions. You can add a quote in one of your rooms, and maybe you need to break it down. It depends on your memory. If your memory is pretty good and you can remember a quote, for example, let's say you have a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, you could put Dr. La M Dr. King in the refrigerator or the toaster or in the sink, I don't want to be, need to be disrespectful, but you could put him, tie him to a landmark and just say, okay, at that point, I'm going to do the Martin Luther King quote. And it helps you. You know, you see Dr. King and he's in the sink and he's taking a bath and, or cleaning onions and you got it. But if you're like me, I can't remember quotes. So I need to break the whole quote into pieces and put that in my memory palace. It's kind of challenging, but it works. It's just more things. It's just more images but I am so relieved when I have it. So for example, one of the famous quotes from Dr. King is, I have a dream that one day our nation will raise up or rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. A lot, right? For me, I would not be able to memorize that quote at all. Maybe if I wrote it down and memorized it over a long period, I would get it and it would still be slippery. But what I do is I break it into little pieces. Okay, I have a dream. Okay, dream. That one day our nation, okay, I can do one day, that's fine, but our nation. So I put nation, that's another image. We'll rise up. Okay, rise up is another image. And live out. Okay, I can probably come up with an image for live out. 
the true meaning, that could be another meaning, uh, image, and Creed could be a final image. I'm thinking Apollo Creed from the Rocky movies. So I might, in a pinch, not that I want to have too many images, but I might break a quote into four or five or six images and stick them in one place. In this case, if we're using the, image, uh, the kitchen image, I could put each image on the burner of the stove. And slowly I could put that. Or I could put it on different shelves of the refrigerator. I could put it in the closet using different aspects of the closet. But it does. it's great for me to know that I have this as a backup. I've got those images in there, and I can do that whole quote. And eventually what happens is after you've done it two or three times, it's memorized, and you can let that image, those images drop away. But how nice to know that it's there. So if you're stuck, you have something to draw on. That's pretty much how it works. So again, just to review, I'm going to actually go skip a couple of slides here. Transitions. Let's just do a little memory palace summary. I'll give you a couple seconds to catch up with this. Memory Palace allows you to transform your main points into vivid images. You place each main point image into a separate room. You turn each sub point into an image and attach it to a landmark in the appropriate room. And then during your speech, you can walk each room, making a note of each landmark image as you pass them by in your mind. You can have as many or as few as you like. It's up to you, depending on your memory. If you have a great memory, you only need your main points and your subpoints. If you have a slippery memory, you'll have many, many more images, but it's great to have that as a fallback if you're in the middle of a speech and you just can't remember anything. And that's how it works. I would like to take a few questions. I'm not sure if we have any questions. We, have, we certainly have the time. So I'm just going to leave that here. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. I'll be uh, thinking if there's any other questions that people have. Actually, yes. A lot of times people ask me, how do you structure this? How do you lay down your, your uh, memory pile? So here's how I do it. I will start with my house, and I will write down the rooms I want to use. So for example, I'll write down office, and I'll put a whole bunch of landmarks in my office, and I'll put them on a sheet. Then I'll write down kitchen, and I'll write down a number of landmarks, and I'll put them on the sheet. Boom, boom, boom. And then I'll maybe have the bathroom, some landmarks in the bathroom, and then the living room, and then a number of landmarks, and so on. And so I'll just write down, basically, I'm charting out my house. Then I'll write down my speech and break it into points, and I'll circle the main point and say, okay, point number one is office. And then I'll start taking the sub points. And I'll just write them next to the landmarks in my office. Okay, we've got the ladder. The first sub point is this. And I'll just write them next to it. And then after I've done that, I start thinking about what are some good images. So I'll just start with creating a sheet and writing landmarks and then my speech points. And I'll just start connecting them and I'll start adding the images. And maybe after I've done the first room, I'll go back in my mind and say, okay, what were the images? What were the landmarks? repeat them a couple of times, and if I've done my job, they're pretty vivid, and I'll never be able to forget them. And then I'll do the next one, next one, next one. And like I said, it takes about an hour. It takes me about an hour to lay down the memory palace for an entire speech. And that sounds like a laborious thing. Usually you feel like, I finished a speech, and I, don't want, I, want, I want to start practicing. But I'm telling you, if you do this upfront work, the speech is a breeze. You don't have to practice. 20 times or 30 times just trying to remember because remembering is easy you've done the upfront work even you know that on the day of speech day you don't have to be desperately trying to remember the words and the page and the outline you know you're just going to step in your house and walk around the house and you'll see your speech points you can wing it you can play it by ear because you know you're going to encounter them and that's great and you just want to make sure that you've got those images down and then you get to have fun now that you've got your speech memorized you can have a ball. You can practice on connecting with your audience. You can practice whatever it is that you need to practice. Movement, gesture, 
variation in tone, eye contact, because you don't have to worry about memorization. And I think this is what I see with, from speakers all the time, is they're looking up, they're looking down, they're trying to memorize their speech, and it takes them away from connecting with the audience. Another question that often comes up is, how do I practice this? I don't have a speech coming up, how do I practice this? What I would recommend is create a memory palace for something simple. For example, the next time you are going shopping, put your shopping list into a memory palace. Put your shopping list into a memory palace and then practice it. Okay, I've got eggs, cheese, vegetables, meat. Hopefully you don't have a, a lot of these horrible stuff, but you've got, uh, how about 10 different vegetables? Whatever it is. I don't want uh, to feed you ideas on what you should have, but you put everything into a memory palace, you create a series of images, connect them to points in your room, and you have practiced your speech, and you can probably do the whole thing without a list. How great is that? So do that for whatever it is, your to-do list. Create a memory palace and practice it, so that when you're doing a speech, it's not the first time. I don't see any questions coming up. It could just be my technology. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and I think wrap this up. I will stay a few minutes afterwards if you have any questions, but let's, I think we should probably go ahead and start wrapping this. Let's see some final thoughts. My goal today was for you to feel more at home with memorizing speeches by putting your speeches in your home. That's what we're doing here. You're not giving a speech, you're spending some time walking around your home. That's all it is. Now Mark Twain said, there are two types of speakers, the nervous and the liars. There are two types of speakers, the nervous and the liars. And that's, I think that's true. Speeches are always nerve wracking. Speeches are always that way, they just are. The good news is memory is just like a muscle. The more that you work at it, the stronger it gets. We're kind of born with our intelligence and we can kind of work on it. However, our memory is something that in fact we can work around and work with it the way that it was wired. It's just like a muscle. The more you exercise, the stronger it gets. And the good news is Memory Palace works with the way your brain is wired. I challenge you to teach the Memory Palace to someone because when you teach something, you learn it twice. So teach the Memory Palace to someone. Just share with them what you're doing here. And then, you know, what happens is they're going to start looking good, giving their speeches. And when they look good, you'll look good. I hope you enjoyed and found this useful. And of course, I would love for you to consider who do you know in your organization who needs to look great during their speeches, but maybe isn't? Are there senior leaders who are relying on notes and cards? Are there sales managers? Maybe it's yourself. I give this Memory Palace speech as a keynote speech in 45 minutes. I also offer it as a 90 minute workshop where we really get down into the weeds and have people doing this for their whole speech. And my contact information and my email is there. I'm gonna switch over to video mode so you can see me, here I am, hey, hey. If you have any questions, I'll hang out for a couple of minutes. Otherwise, it's been a pleasure sharing with you the Memory Palace. And I hope that you go out and give it a try. It sounds like it's complex. And a lot of people will say I'm not creative, but it has revolutionized how I do my public speaking. This entire speech is in a memory pause for me. I didn't have to use notes, which is awesome. I'm giving a speech on Monday. I just laid down my memory palace and I feel very confident that I'll be able to remember my speech. I will never space out again in front of an audience, which is just a miserable experience as you can say, because nobody wants to look bad. I do not see any further questions. Again, I will hang out for another minute. The Memory Palace, it's worth giving a try. I've been so grateful for it because I was ready to quit. So ready to quit. It was so painful to stand up there and look terrible because I couldn't remember. Now, I remember my speeches, I get to focus on doing the thing that I want to be doing, which is connecting with the audience and giving them a powerful experience. And that doesn't happen when you're going, uh, I don't know, uh, what's my next point? 
Okay, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you for coming. Here's my contact information again. If you'd like to bring this to your organization, company, your Rotary Club, to any clubs, I'd be happy to come because I'm so excited about this and I wanna share it with people so they can stop stressing about speaking. There's no reason that you have to worry about having a terrible memory when you've got a technique that works with your brain, works with your caveman brain. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure, and we'll catch you next time.